Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Karen an alcoholic. And it's truly through the grace of God and the power of Alcoholics Anonymous that I've been sober since May 30th, 1982. And that does not make me a miracle. It makes Alcoholics Anonymous a miracle. And if you're new here tonight, I want to welcome you to AA. And I always call it God's magnificent AA, the one that saved my life and is going to save yours too, if you want to take a few quick actions. I suggest strongly you get a sponsor tonight, that you get that book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and you get busy. Everybody else is doing around here. And you know, stay sober as I've stayed sober for 22 years. And people like me cannot stay sober, I can guarantee you. My home group is the Pacific Group in West L.A., a group I'm very, very proud to be a member of, just as I'm sure you're proud to be a member of yours. And I guess if you're not proud, you ought to get a job and you might change your mind. I certainly have a job, and I'm proud to have that job. I thank Dave and the committee for inviting you to come out. This is an honor and a privilege. It's one that I do not take lightly, I'll guarantee you. You guys, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I really do. And I think that it shows, and I make an awful lot of mistakes. I do an awful lot of things wrong. But I'll tell you one thing, that I love you. Make no mistake about that. You know, I've been taught to do an awful lot of things before I ever wrote my big mouth. And one of the things talked to my sponsor. And Clancy sends you his love and very best wishes tonight. And they've been in this room is wondering why I have a man for a sponsor and why I have Clancy for a sponsor. It's really quite simple. I did not get sober in California. I got sober in a place called Lincoln, Nebraska. And was not doing well at Alcoholics Anonymous in Lincoln, Nebraska. I went through 19 sponsors at a rapid clip. And I'm certainly not proud of this. I stand here tonight. And thank God for the old timers. And A, can somebody love me enough to get my current sponsor? And I can tell you that my life has done nothing but totally, completely trans with all of that. And I obviously adore the ground that that man walks on. I talked to him a little while ago. He's in Hawaii. And, and I said, wish me luck tonight. He said, get up there and share your experience, your strength, and your hope. And tell those people what it was like, what happened, what it's like now. Ignore the old timers. They got it. They don't need your inspiration, my dear. And, and talk <laughs> directly to those people with the life and blood of AA. And, and I believe that as I stand here and I welcome you and I hope you stand. And I think I did, without a doubt, the most important thing I can ever do. And that's to say, God, please help me say what you want me to say to these people. God is very much a part of my life tonight. You guys are not used to be that way for me, I can guarantee you. I thank my beautiful friend Cassie for picking me up from the airport, and she's going to take me back tomorrow. And my beautiful friend Brandy who replaced Cassie last night while she was in the play. I have known these women most of my sobriety, these two girls, and I just love them dearly. And I know so many people down here. Thank you so much. If you're new here tonight, this is one of the greatest conferences in the world. Trust me, it is. And this committee deserves a tremendous round of applause from us, I'll tell you. You know, I, as we were driving over here tonight in the golf cart, um, we passed the family portrait being taken of Vinoy and her family. And there was a person missing tonight, and that was Jim Shaw. And I can break his anonymity because he's no longer with us, so I can do that. But Jim Shaw was my AA brother, you guys, and I absolutely adored this man. He taught me how to be of service around here. He used to introduce me as, this is my little AA sister, Karen. And I, did, I love that, and I miss that so much. But I have a funny story to tell you. When Jim was dying, and he was really probably the last three weeks of his, of his, of his life and stuff, I told him, I said, why don't you go into L.A. and go shop, and let me come out there, bring up somebody I sponsor with me. We'll take Jim out. We'll take care of him. Let me spend some time with him. You go take a break. And she didn't really want to do that, and we talked her into it. So then all hell broke loose, let me tell you. But So anyway, we sent her on her way, and I said, Jim, what? Zenoy wants you to eat that stuff in the icebox. Do you want to eat that crap? And he said, no, I want to go to McDonald's. I said, let's go. <laughs> we got him in the car with his oxygen tank, and he said, Karen, please don't smoke in this car. It'll blow up. And I said, I'm not going to smoke in the car. So we took him to McDonald's, and he said, don't tell Vinoy I did this. I said, well, you can't drag it out of my mouth. And he went home and told her I did it. But anyway. <laughs> Last three weeks of Jim Shaw's life, I want you guys to know, he had two double cheeseburgers at McDonald's, two big orders of fries, two chocolate malts, and one apple pie. And he loved every minute of it, let me tell you. But anyway, and we went driving around Palm Springs area and stuff, and we just had a delightful afternoon with him. And he went over to Keith and Sally Carpenter's house, who are your members of our fellowships and so forth. And what a great, and thank you so much for letting me do that. What an honor and privilege that was for me to, to be able to do that. I miss him terribly. I miss him terribly. And as you all know, Vinoy and Jim started this conference, and, you know, so I remember him as I stand here tonight. I think that's really, really important. So, anyway, like I said earlier, my sobriety date is May 30th, 1982. It was not always my sobriety date. When I got my current sponsor, I had to change that date, and there's a reason for that. I'm one of these people who had to go to smoke dope when I got sober. And, you know, if you're smoking marijuana in this room tonight, 
you are not sober now, for so I will tell you right this minute. I don't want to argue about it afterwards. Ask any old timers if you don't believe me. And if I have to change my date, then by God, so do you. But <laughs> I got my current sponsor, and I tried to explain to him that I'm from in Lincoln. Now, I want you to know they don't do this in Omaha, but where I'm from in Lincoln, you can have two sobriety dates, and one from alcohol, one from drugs. And I rather quickly pointed out that to my sponsor, and he said, I don't give a damn what they do. If you want me for a sponsor, you're changing your sobriety date. We don't smoke dope in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, where does the book mention pot? He said, well, the book does mention pot. And I said, Clancy, I have read that book. It's not talk about marijuana in that book. And he said, if I find the word pot in that book, will you change your sobriety or argue with me again? And I knew I was making a bad deal, you guys, but I did anyway. And I'll be damned if he didn't flip open the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. On the first page of Bill Wilson's story, it says, died by musket or by pot. I said, that is not what that means. <laughs> he said, little girl, I don't give a damn what it means. You said the book didn't mention pot. It does mention pot. Change your sobriety. <laughs> and my life is flourished, I've got to tell you guys. I want to thank my two babies, Cindy and Michelle, for driving over and seeing the sponsor tonight. And I'd love to see these when we're going to be together next weekend, too. But, you know, the day I got sober, I weighed 95 pounds. I was the color squash. And now called like hepatitis, I had liver cirrhosis, I had ruptured esophageal varices. And if you don't know what that stuff is, you don't want to lose because you die from that kind of stuff. And I was standing on Skid Row in Lincoln, Nebraska, sucking on a bottle of Mad Dog. And if you guys haven't drank Mad Dog, I need to tell you it's not one of your finer wines, I can assure you. Uh, I'll guarantee you one thing, that crap has never seen a grape, make no mistake about that. Uh, I literally could not believe what's going on in my life. I'd lost my children. I'd lost my husband twice. All I really care about that, I want you to know. I lost my car. I lost my house. I destroyed every relationship I'd ever had with anybody, and I was clearly dying from alcoholism. And then I lost the one thing that brought my knees and disease. I lost my nursing license. And you guys, I love my profession. That absolutely devastated me. It did not stop me from drinking. And there's a reason for that. And it's in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, because I have an obsession that somehow, someday, I will under control and enjoy my drinking. The persistent illusion is astonishing, just like our book talks about and he was pursuing the gates of insanity and death. And I'll guarantee you one thing. I was in the gates of pure insanity. I got sober and almost into my coffin. And I am so grateful for this program as I stand here tonight. I cannot begin to tell you. And you're going to soon see why and stuff. But, you know, you guys, this has been the very, very best year of my sobriety, my 22nd year. Actually, it was my 21st. I just turned 22. But I want to share a little bit of that with you. You know, if you would have asked me New Year's Eve, a year ago New Year's Eve, are your men's made in alcohol Thomas? I would have said yes, and that would have been the absolute truth for me. I'm $86,000 out of debt in this program. I owe nobody nothing. I just got to go to meetings, pray, work with others, do my commitments, and I'm home free here. But our book says that more will be revealed, folks. And I flew to Kansas City, Missouri on New Year's Eve a year ago to give an AA talk and did this big party dance type thing. And so, anyway, air traffic control held us for whatever reason, so we were circling the city. And, and I spied the Hyatt Regency Hotel, and I thought, oh, my God, there's the Hyatt Regency. And I remembered something I'd done about 35 years ago. 35 years ago on Easter morning, I found myself in a glass elevator at the Hyatt Regency Hotel, stark naked on Easter morning. I know. And it landed on the first floor of the hotel. I had no idea where the hell I was. I really don't. I'd like to think I was in some man's room, but you never know. But anyway. Anyway, the door opened up, and there was this family standing in their Easter clothes. They were going to have brunch or something. I will never forget the look on these people's faces as long as I live. And you know, I read my inventory to my sponsor, and I did not mention that for whatever reason. I did so much of this sort of thing, I guess I just didn't even remember it. But anyway, I called Clancy. He said, well, get over there and make amends for that. You probably gave the place a bad name. And I thought, well, if I have time, I'll get over there and get that done. I was only going to be there for 24 hours. That's not much time, and that committee keeps you busy. And I did not have time to do it. So I went back up to the airport in years to go back to L.A., and my flight was canceled. I thought, great, I've got five hours to wait. I can take a shuttle, go back to the higher regency, and sit down and talk to somebody, although I doubt if anybody's even going to be there. And boy, I was wrong about that, let me tell you. I sat down with the manager of the high regency hotel, and I told him what I'd done. He said, Karen, stop, I have to tell you a funny story. He said, 35 years ago, my father was manager of the high regency at the time, and we were over here having Easter brunch, and we were by the glass elevator. <laughs> by the glass elevator and a naked woman got off. And he said, I'd never seen a naked woman. I said, well, I'm sorry I had to be your first one, but you, know, you got to take what you get, folks. And he said, guess what, Mom and Dad are here this week. And I thought, oh, wonderful. He said, they're, they're celebrating their, their 65th wedding anniversary. Let's have them come down and meet you. And I thought, let's not, you know. 
we don't say that. We just go along with that. I said, whatever you want to do will be fine with you. So mom and dad came down. I thought, my God, they're probably 100 years old on walkers. They'll probably have a heart attack when they find him. Well, one more time, I was wrong about that. I sat down with the loveliest people I had ever met before in my life, and, and they laughed. They said, Karen, we talked about you for years in the bar. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I bet you do, too. And I said, you know, I'm so sorry I embarrassed you and your family all those years ago. What can I do to make that right? And they said, just don't ever do it again. <laughs> I said, you know what? I can't think of any more disgusting than a 59-year-old woman getting out of a glass elevator stark naked. So I doubt very much she'll probably be taking that path anytime soon. So as I stand here tonight, my amends are made in Alcoholics Anonymous. No more has been revealed. But I will tell you, it's not midnight yet, folks. You never know what's going to happen here. You know, last May I was over in Los Angeles, Nevada, speaking at the Tri-State Roundup. And if you guys haven't experienced that, come to it. It's a great event. They get about six, 7,000 people this thing. And we were hanging around the casino on Thursday night waiting for the meeting to start. And I hit a $10,000 slot is what I did. And I was to experience every promise in the big book about my time in a five-second class. I was to know a new freedom and new happiness. And, you know, fear of financial insecurity left me. And, I was rocking that fourth dimension of living. Uh, but if you're new here tonight, that is not how you get the promises now. <laughs> but I got them. I swear to God I didn't. And it was such a, a great experience because Don Lawson, who owns that hotel over there, came down to, to, you know, you always get management's attention if you hit a slot like that. Trust me, they want their money back is what they want. But he came down and he said, you know, can we extend your stay? And I said, no, just give me a check. I'm taking it back to L.A. And he said, what are you doing here this weekend? And I told him, he said, Oh, I'd love to hear the A speakers. Can I come to your talk? And I said, well, it's your hotel. Why would you want to do that? And he said, I think they are so funny. And he came, and by God, he was in line the next night thanking me. And he said to me, are you sure we can't extend your stay? <laughs> they never give up, folks. But, <laughs> I'm happy to report you that I brought that money back to Los Angeles. I paid my car off with it. And I'm one more time debt free in our So it's a great position to be in, let me tell you guys. But anyway, you know. In our book, After My Psalm, it says that great events will come to pass for us and countless others. And I want to share a very great event in my life with you. It won't be in your lives, but it's most certainly in mine. You know, when I got sober, you guys, my family wanted absolutely nothing to do with me. They had to throw all the crap they were going to take off me years before I quit drinking. They had to walk me from their own sanity. So through amends and sponsorship and what we do around here, it's all turned around for me now. It will take a long time for it to happen. And on my 20th day birthday, I got a phone call from my little grandson. My little grandson, Ryan, is quite a gymnast, you guys. I knew he was good, but I know he was that good. And my son and his wife got a phone call from Budweiser out of St. Louis, Missouri, wanted to sponsor this kid and train him for the Olympics, you guys. And, and so my son called me, and he says, he told me, and I, you know, I jumped from phone call to Olympic Stadium, gold medal around his neck, and what will I wear, you know? I haven't just that quick, but I found myself telling my child, Jeff, you have to do what you think is right. This is your son, not mine. I wanted to shriek him and say, let him go, you idiots, the opportunity of a lifetime. And, Anyway, Budweiser wanted to sponsor him, and they put him down here in Norman, Oklahoma, at Nadia Comaneci and Bart Connors Clinic, and, and Ryan was down here for a year and a half, and Ryan has just fallen in his AC joint separation, so no Olympics, he's done, you guys, he's done Dylan, so, but you know, that's beside the point, he had a wonderful, I was doing worse than he was with it, let me tell you, he said, Grandma, I've had a wonderful experience down here, I'm going to teach someday, he said, it's not all lost here, so he's like, I've got so many wonderful people, and he loves Nadia and, and Bart Connors and those people, so, but you know, I wanted to go to Greece this summer, I really wanted to go to Greece in August, you know, that's how selfish I am, but it's not going to happen, so, but anyway, on my 20th day birthday, this baby called me about 10 o'clock at night. It was his very first day down in Oklahoma. And he said, Grandma, you know, he said, I'm so sorry to call you so late. And I said, it is never too late to call your grandmother. Don't you ever think that. And he said, oh, Grandma, I wanted to wish you a happy 20th day, birthday. And you guys, I just stood there and cried like a baby. And he said, oh, Grandma, I didn't make you cry. And I said, you didn't make me cry, Ryan. I'm crying because I'm so happy you called me. And he said, oh, Grandma, we're so proud of you. And I thought, oh, stop. You know, but anyway, <laughs> the same thing happened on AA birthday number 21. And number 22. And by God, Ryan, you keep those phone calls to coming because your grandma loves every single one of them, I'm going to tell you. But they say you never know what's going to happen in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new here tonight, your family's not speaking to you, don't worry about it. Just take the, the direction your sponsor's giving you. Work with others. Come in here and do the deal. And maybe it'll turn around for you like it did for me someday. But I had no hope of that for that at one time. And boy, I was wrong about it. But, but anyway, I'm delighted to be here. And I love this conference. This is my second time here. And Clancy and I spoke in 1997 together, and we had a great time down here, so I was so thrilled when David asked me to come again. You know, it's always nice to be invited. It's doubly nice to be invited back, let me tell you. So, 
But anyway, I'm also delighted you don't have a glass. Oh, you can see your speaker. I had this terrible experience on the East Coast. I was out there talking. Right when I talked, my spurt fell off in front of 3,000 people. <laughs> and I, I had this black seat on with this wraparound skirt, and the button came down. I thought, my God, my skirt's going to fall on the floor. And it was too late. It was on the floor. But you guys, you know what? <laughs> Alcoholics like Anonymous has taught me to wear underwear, and thank God I had some on. <laughs> It's also taught me to take action. I just picked up that skirt and kept right on talking. What else did you do? <laughs> you know, I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska. You guys, I have a, had a, came from a wonderful home in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I want you to know that. And my mother wants you to know it too. I'll guarantee you that. You know, my mom died 12 years ago. And God, I miss her so much. I can't begin to tell you. Boy, folks, you only get one. And when they're gone, they're gone. Let me tell you. I made amends to her many, many years ago. We had a wonderful relationship the last few years of life and stuff, but I just miss her so much. And I come from an alcoholic home, and I don't think that's neither here nor there. I don't do well with people who stand AA podiums and blame anybody for anything. And my father died from this disease on the streets of Chicago in 1979. And you tell me how Major in the Air Force dies on Skid Row. I don't know how that happened, other than the fact that he was an alcoholic. And whether they ever found A or not, I do not know. I just know that he certainly did not stay sober as a result of it. So one more time tonight, this is a cunning, baffling, powerful disease that kills people. This is not a game I'm playing up to. This is serious business. And I would give me the world if my father were alive tonight because we would have a lot to talk about, I can tell you. I have a sister who was Miss Raw Raw in high school and homecoming queen and cheerleader and all that kind of stuff and made straight A's and never cracked a book. And I made straight F's and never cracked a book. And that was the difference. My sister was a beautiful little girl. She's a gorgeous woman today. She looks nothing like I do, I gotta tell you. And she was a model for many, many years from Neiman Marcus and Dallas, and now she's retired and teaches school in the West Indies. And I gotta tell you guys, as a direct result of this program, I love my sister very, very much tonight. And I found out something about her. She's also very beautiful on the inside, too, and I never used to know that. I have a brother who was a fighter pilot in the Navy for many, many years, and my brother retired a couple of years ago in August. And 9-11 in Iraq and so forth. He's been called back in the service. And, you know, my brother is really old to be a fire pilot. You guys, he's 51 years old. And you were growing up, I thought he was such a dork, I can't begin to tell you. Straight as an arrow, Mike, doesn't drink, doesn't use drugs, doesn't screw around. He was an embarrassment to me if he wanted to the truth. <laughs> And tonight, I'm so proud of that man, I cannot begin to tell you. He wouldn't catch me over Iraq in any fighter plane, but either one of these people are alcoholic. And I have another sister who's married the public defender in Lincoln, Nebraska, who got me out of a whole bunch of trouble when I got sober, and I'm welcome in their homestay, and I never used to be. I come from basically a very boring family, if you want the truth. They're high successful people, and they bore me to tears. I love them, but they bore me to tears. And I have a couple of kids who are 43 and 44 years old, and I know I certainly don't old enough to have kids at age, but by God, I sure do. And, and this is where it really starts getting interesting for me. These kids are anything but boring, i got to tell you guys. As a matter of fact, they're a couple of jerks, if you want to know the truth. But you know what? Those couple of jerks have given me five of the most gorgeous grandbabies you have ever seen before in your life. And those babies have never seen their grandmother drink, and I hope to God that they never do and stuff. But, you know, like I said, things with my family are very, very good tonight, and I thank you for that. That's the most precious thing I've gotten in that place, Um you know, I really don't remember my first drink, you guys, but I can tell you that I hope to God I never forget my last one. And I hope it was my last one. Remember what alcohol did for me from the very beginning? It made me feel like I belonged. I could do anything I wanted to be. I could do anything I wanted to do. I drank at any given opportunity after that, and I was probably about 13 years old. You know, I realize that I'm going to meet at Alcoholics Anonymous time, and I honor your podium by talking about alcoholism up here. I used a lot of drugs, too. They did a small part of my story. My sponsor encourages me to do that. You know, when I was growing up in Nebraska, there just wasn't a lot of drugs on the street. But I'll guarantee you, I found every single one of those drugs. And, you know, there was some marijuana and speed and stuff. And today, if you get caught for possession of marijuana, you get a ticket. Big deal. When I was growing up, you went to prison is what happened to you. And that didn't scare me. Absolutely nothing scared me. I think I wasn't supposed to be doing it. I'm one of these alcoholic females. And I hate to say this from an AA podium, but it's precisely the way that it was for me. And we're supposed to tell the truth up here. That if you pat me on the head, my pants fall off is what happens to me. And I... I got myself into a lot of trouble when I was growing up. I absolutely love men. I love everything about them. You name it about, and I love the band. They've been the downfall of my entire existence, and they remain the same today, I'm sorry to say. And I particularly like sick men. There's a room full of here tonight, I can tell you. You know, I can just feel it. You know, I'm 59 years old, you guys, and I have a boyfriend. You better well believe I have a boyfriend. He lives in New York, and I live in L.A. That's why we get along so well and stuff. But, you know, I had the most perfect relationship, you guys. Would you like to hear about my relationship? This relationship? Shut up. You guys have been trying to tell my boyfriend for a long time. Here's what we do, and this will, is what we're... I'm not saying you should do this. I'm saying it works for me. You know, we see each other two or three times a month. 
go to the theater, go to the show, eat dinner, get laid, and don't call me tomorrow. That's just the way I want it, you know. And so does he, by the way. Sorry, but that's the way I feel. Am I going to get in trouble for saying that? Probably. Renoy Shaw has been trying to steal my boyfriend ever since I've had him. Isn't that disgusting? I got pregnant when I was six. Oh, i got to tell you guys a funny story. I almost, I think it's very important I tell this story. You know, about 13 years ago, I was in Nashville, Tennessee, speaking of one of the fine ladies of Nashville, Tennessee, A, walked up to me afterwards, I want you to know. And this woman said to me, she said, you're disgusting. And she wasn't kidding you guys. She meant every word of it. And I said, ladies, from where I come from, being disgusting is a step up, I can assure you. And furthermore, if I want you to scotch me, I phoned to Nashville and asked you. You know, I hear some women get this podium, and I wonder if they ever drank, you guys. I really do. Do all their drinking rooms that shoot through the keyhole with an eyedropper. I was out there big time. I got myself into a lot of trouble. I've been talking to share that Philly and Alcoholics Anonymous. And if I offend anybody here tonight, I would never offend anybody in the program to save my life. And besides that, my book tells me, and this is my favorite part of our book, it says, clean to the thought that in God's hands your dark past will be the greatest possession that you have. And it goes on to say, because you can literally avert death and misery for others. And I found that to be very, very true in my sobriety. So if I offend anybody here, I don't want to hear about it afterwards. But anyway, I got pregnant when I was 16 years old, and I had to get married. And in my day, girls, you had to get married. There was no ifs, ands, and buts about that. That's just what we did. And I was 16. He was 17. Is it must be I married an alcoholic? Don't most alcoholic women. I go for colorful, exciting men that beat the hell, you know, all kinds of stuff. And he wasn't even a man, you guys. He was only 17 years old. And, and uh, you know, some of we had no education. We hadn't finished junior high yet. And so we were doing minimum wage jobs. And before we knew it, we had two babies to take care of. And I could find out what caused all that. And I put a halt to it, I'll guarantee you that. And that caused me a lot of trouble throughout the years. And so, Mary, it must be I married a man that refused to work. They drank on a daily basis. He used to come and beat me up on a daily basis. And I had never seen a man hit a woman before in my life, you guys. I'll guarantee you one thing. If my dad would lay one hand on my mom, she'd have knocked him from here to the moon, i got to tell you. And I grew to hate this guy very, very much. And I'm not blaming him for my disease, so please don't get me wrong. It's just part of my story, and I didn't share it. And, and somebody in that family had to get a job. And like I said, I hadn't finished junior high yet, for Christ's sakes. And I found a job as a nurse today at the hospital there in Lincoln. And the magic was put in my life. I literally fell in love with nursing. And I made a plan to myself. I would love to go to school, and I'd love to become a registered nurse. That's what I would love to do. You know, they say that alcoholics don't have willpower. And I'm here to tell you now from this podium, that is a bunch of crap. I have more willpower than 20 elephants. I have no willpower when it comes to my disease. But when I want to do something, I'm going to do it. And I went back. I finished junior high. I finished high school. I went to college full-time for three years, and I worked full-time for three years. And I'm talking about 18, 20 hours a day, you guys, and that is hard stuff to do. I did not drink. I usually drugs during this period of time. At the age of 27 years old, I became a registered nurse. And if you think I'm proud to stand here tonight and tell you that I got jerked in front of the State Board of Nursing in Nebraska, and they told me, you are a disgrace to your profession, you're a disgrace to nursing, you're a disgrace to medicine, you are no longer working because we just jerked your nursing license. If you think I'm proud of that, you are sadly wrong. You guys, I love my profession, and I really, really mean that. And I would never do anything to jeopardize the people I take care of or the people I work with in ordinary circumstances. And what I had to tell you now is a story about how I threw it right down the toilet so I could drink. And that is total insanity. It's also called alcoholism. At the age of 27 years old, I divorced this man. And girls, i got to tell you that a whole new world opened up to me. It's called men and alcohol. And I went absolutely hog wild is what I did. I was engaged eight times during that divorce. I never did marry these people. Two of them died from alcoholism. I know nothing about social drinking. I drank and with alcoholics and we do indeed die from this. And at the age of 27 years old, I went to work in surgery at a hospital there in Nebraska, and I had that job for 19 years. I love working in the operating room. I love taking care of those patients. It's a colorful, exciting nursing position. I drank. They were medical people mostly. They were colorful, intense people. They worked hard, and they paid them. And i got to tell you guys that the instance of alcoholism amongst my profession is tremendously high, and that I do a lot for your security. You're going to have surgery next week. It has to be very, very true. And those people are so grateful that I'm sober that they can't see straight. And I'm talking about alcoholics is what I'm talking about. You know, in our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, it says clearly that we're telling the general way what our drinking was like. You're going to get the general idea real quick what my drinking was like. I can tell you guys about my drinking in five seconds, flashing the truth. Many, many years ago, I was at a little concert in upstate New York called Woodstock. And I'm not talking about that piece of crap they had nine years ago. I'm talking about the real Woodstock. And there will never be another one, trust me on that. The kids in the 60s threw a party that nobody will ever match, I'm quite sure. You know why there'd ever be another one? That wasn't supposed to happen to begin with. But anyway, New York got when they're going to have this big event. And they told these people, if you don't get medical coverage, you are not going to have this concert. 
and started to hire people from Nebraska. They thought they'd be more responsible. And we were a seedy lot, I can assure you. And I was the first drunk to sign up for this deal. And find nine girls I worked with to join me. And they had about 80 doctors from New York and never wrote Woodstock. I never seen so much alcohol in one place in my entire life. You could have floated a bath for no problem whatsoever. And the drugs, it was like a candy store. And every we were sharing, we were sharing narcotics on everybody else. And we had this great big semi truck on that back lot of Woodstock. That was our hospital park back there. And I recall being in that semi the entire week. But I do recall what it was like to stand on the stage and night that Richie Haven sang Freedom and Joe Cocker and Country Joe sang ten of those groups that I love. I come from the roaring 60s, you guys, and I love rock and roll, let me tell you. Things have not changed in my life one little tiny bit. I loved Elvis Presley, and Janis Joplin was my lady, let me tell you. Wouldn't Janis Joplin have been a fine member of Alcoholic Thomas, you guys? I'd have hung out with Janis, let me tell you. I'd have traded Janis for Clancy any day that was easy on the floor. is a big fat lie. Do not tell him I said that. I was just kidding. I would trade my sponsor for 20 Janice Joplin's. But, you know, drinking for me at one time was a fun thing, you guys. It'd be a lie for me to stand on the same thing but that. But I cannot remember the fun after the pain that it caused me. And one more time, I am so grateful for Alcoholics Thomas, I cannot begin to tell you. And you're going to soon see why. And, you know, the drunk driving charges, the bad checks, all the stuff that we eventually do. My kids were in trouble. I never could marry these guys I was engaged to. They kept dying from alcoholism. And I thought, you know, I need to get married to my ex-husband again. That's what I need to do. The kids need their father. Besides, I need to get even with him for all the things that he's done to me. And those are not very good reasons to get married again, i got to tell you. And I'm certainly not proud as I stand here tonight. And, you know, if anybody in this room sick, outside here is thinking about getting married to the same person twice, don't do it. You're going to be sorry. The only way I can describe it is like taking a bite out of the same turd twice. If you will. <laughs> I danced that man through three of the most miserable years of his life on the face of this earth. And I love to tell you guys this story I'm about ready to tell you. And my sponsor always tells me that is not funny, and you should not be telling that from the AA podiums. I said, okay, fine, then I won't tell anymore. And he said, no, go ahead and tell those people to see how sick you were, and apparently how sick you still are. And I'm still sick, and I still think it's funny, and I'm telling the story. When I married him again, I told him, I said, if you ever hit me again, buddy, I will kill you next time you hit me. And he said, I'll never hit you again ever. And I said, you better see that you don't. And he lied is what he did. And he came home drunk one night, and I happened to be sober this night for some reason. I'll never know why, because I usually wasn't. And, and girls, you know what guys do when they come home drunk. They want to take you to bed and stuff. And I was not buying it. If there's anything I can't stand, it's some drunk man mauling me when I'm sober. And, you know, I... I will say that when the shoe's on their foot, though, it's fine with me. And, you know, that guy came home. That guy came home and indicated that to me, and I said, "You get your hands off me and leave me alone. I wanted nothing to do with him." Period. And he broke my arm. And I'm here to tell you guys that I was pissed. As a matter of fact, I'm still pissed about it. You know the truth. <laughs> I told him, I said, you go to sleep on that couch and so help me God when you wake up, you're going to wish you'd never been born. And he sat up for hours, you guys, with his eyes bright open. And as it must be, he finally passed out. And I started drinking martinis. And this is a classic example of what alcohol did for me. Alcohol told me what to do. I didn't tell it what to do. I had about eight, ten martinis, and I was feeling no pain, I can assure you. And I was sitting there watching this guy. And I hate to tell you what this man was doing, but I can't tell you the story unless I can tell you what he was doing. He was laying on the couch playing with himself. I thought, you disgusting man, you make me sick to my stomach. And the more I drank, the madder I got. And you guys, you know, I'm a nurse, and I'm very familiar with male anatomy. And I'd be very familiar with male anatomy if I wasn't a nurse. But, you know, I thought to myself, what can I do to get even this guy for all the things he's done to me? And I came up with this brilliant idea in my drunken stupor. That's one thing we should never do, folks, is drink and think at the same time. You know, this was many, many years ago, you guys, when super glue first came out. And super glue was powerful stuff. You know, Mrs. Bobbitt has nothing on me, I can assure you. I was a foreign for she ever got started. I got that super glue out, and I read the directions on that super glue. And like I said, I was drunk, and I wasn't seeing very clearly. And what I thought those directions said were, if this hits human skin, you better get locked in 15 hours. Now, why would it say something stupid like that? What it said was, in fact, if this hits human skin, you better get locked in five minutes, is what it said. And I want this guy, I get so excited when I tell this story, I can just do it all over. <laughs> and I poured super glue all over this guy's groin, and I mean everywhere. There was not one place, man, I have super glue, and I laughed about it, and I went to bed. And I woke up in the morning just screams of horror, like you cannot even believe it. 
you know, I did not mean to hurt this guy as bad as I did. I swear to God, that's true. But I'll tell you what happened to my ex-husband. This guy never had the advantage of being circumcised when he was born, and now he clearly was, I can tell you. Anyway, we had a telephone by our bed there, and our bed there, Lincoln. He called the police, and the cops were in front of our home with their sirens going. There was an ambulance out there. You know, one thing you got to keep in mind here, they do not see things like this happen in Lincoln, Nebraska. In California, it would not surprise me one bit, but certainly not there. And the cops were laughing. We said the whole thing was funny. And they said, lady, are you crazy or what? Why would you do something like this? And I stood there and I said, what makes you think that I did it anyway? And they said, you have glue all over your hands, for Christ's sakes. And you're under arrest for assault and battery. I said, you cannot arrest wives in Nebraska for assault and battery against their husbands. I knew better than that. And two days later when I got out of jail, I guess I didn't know better than that. And they took that man to the very hospital that I worked at in surgery, and he had to have surgery. And one more time, the whole staff saw what Karen did, and they took me to jail, I might add. And it turned out to be a terrible thing. Those doctors down in Lincoln couldn't get that glue off. And they had to get two surgeons down from Creighton University Medical School in Omaha, Nebraska, to get that glue off. And you know, there's a paper in about that at Creighton. And if any of thinking about going to medical school there, you can read about it if you want to. I'd always wanted a paper in about me, but not like this, I'm going to tell you. And, and I was sitting in that jail thinking to myself, I am getting the hell out of this marriage. When this guy comes home from the hospital, he's going to glue something to mine shut. And he would have, too, i got to tell you. I'm sorry, but he would have. And God only knows I couldn't have that happen. You know, but for those of you who don't know this, that happened to a lady in Kentucky about three years ago. It was on the national news, and I was on the freeway in L.A. I had a wreck when I heard that. My God better her than me, i got to tell you. But anyway. I divorced him one more time, and you know we have an immense step in this program. And my sponsor didn't get in the airplane and fly to Sacramento, California, and they convinced my ex-husband where he currently lives. And I tried to tell Clancy, I'm not sorry that I did that. Therefore, I'm going to have to make the amends. He said, get on that airplane and do what I'm asking you to do, and maybe one of these days you will be sorry. And I don't tell anybody in this room tonight. When that guy sees me, he kind of backs up. Let me tell you, but we're able to sit down and talk and stuff. And I made my amends to him. And I will tell you guys, I walked away from that man. I was free of what I had done to him. I was free of being married to him twice. And I will tell you, for the first time in my sobriety, the promises of the book of Alcoholics Thomas came true in my life. And you know what else I found out about that? Motives mean nothing here, folks. My motives sucked on that one, let me tell you. But I still got the promises. So go figure. It's action, not motives that count around here. But I have to tell you guys about this. I almost forgot to tell this. I went up to Long Pop Prison uh, to speak about a year and a half ago. And as most of us know, it's a men's middle pin fishery in Central Coast, California. And they have this monthly speakers meeting, so they invite folks to come up and share and so forth. So I drove up there, and you have to go to the guard tower, and you push a button, and they say, who are you, and what is your business? And I told them, they said, well, Mrs. Garrison, do you have any weapons on you, any guns, knives, explosives? And I said, no. And they said, well, Mrs. Garrison, do you have any super glue on you? <laughs> For the first time in my life, I was totally speechless, you know. They're on the guard tower laughing. You guys, it was so funny. The prisoners put them up to it and stuff. So I said, well, no, as a matter of fact, I don't. They said, well, you can come on in. I said, okay. So the prisoners took me to the meeting room, and there's this black one there. And there's a great big circle with a slash. No super glue in here. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. I like Thomas. But anyway, I divorced this guy one more time, and I got involved with the most bizarre man I've ever met before in my life. This guy told me he was in the mafia. Now, I don't think anybody in Lincoln, Nebraska is in the mafia, for Christ's sakes. And I was lying to him, and he was lying to me. It was your typical alcoholic nightmare is what it was. I was drinking on a daily basis. I was taking Valium for severe tremors I was starting to have. It was beginning to be no more fun, i got to tell you guys. You know, I'm a nurse, and I've studied alcoholism. I knew all about it before I became one. It shows me one more time tonight what our book says is so true. Self-knowledge avails us nothing of this disease. It's action that counts. Nowhere in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous do we have a chapter called Into Thinking. We do have one that's called Into Action. And that's the only reason I'm standing here 21 years sober, 22 years sober. And the day came to me, the hospital told me, we've had all the crap we're going to take off of you, Karen. You're the finest nurse on this staff, but we're tired of reading about you in the paper. You obviously have a drinking problem. You cannot read about our nursing staff, gluing husbands, drunk driving charges, bad checks, all the stuff that you're doing. Everything you do in Nebraska is in the paper, I'm sorry to say. And they knew my game, let me tell you. They said, you're either going to a treatment center, are you out of here? I said, you can't run this place without me. Not only can they, they still are, folks. But anyway, I walked out of the job that I love more than in the whole world, and I cannot see that enough tonight. And I drank, and I drank, and I died, and I died a thousand times over. I went to work at a nursing home there in Lincoln, and what I'm ready to share with you guys is something I am not proud to discuss from the AA podium. It took me years in my sobriety before I would ever mention this. 
I found myself still in drug madness, you know. And it wasn't because I like drugs. It has nothing to do with anything. I would drink any day over a drug I could name. But I was physically addicted to alcohol by now. I had to have this stuff. I couldn't drink it. Whoops, so I started stealing narcotics. It's just that damn simple. And I was still on morphine and Demerol and cocaine and Valium, and I get my hands on it. And if you think I'm proud of that, you are sadly wrong. And the day came me, the people that ran that place came up to me, and they said, Karen, what is wrong with you? You are just weird as what you are. You know, you take good care of the patients. You're a great nurse, but you're just strange. And I remember thinking to myself, you'd be strange, too, if you had 200 milligrams of Demerol on board. You'd be strange, too. And I threw my keys at them, and I walked out the door before they fired me. And I went to work at Bryan Memorial Hospital there in Lincoln. And you guys, it's a fine, fine facility. And I was drunk on that area of that nursing position. And I'm not talking about falling down drunk. I was just maintaining a certain level of alcohol in my bloodstream that I would not shake and have those violent tremors. That is clearly desperation drinking. Our book describes it vividly. And I was in the hot water up to my yin yang, let me tell you. The very thought that I might drink again makes the hair on my neck stand straight up. And that's why I'm an active, active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. But the day came for me when I got caught red handed still some morphine in the hospital. And this is got me without a doubt the most humiliating day of my entire life. And they said, you give us your narcotic keys, and you get out of this hospital, and you can walk back in here again, report this to the State Board of Nursing in Nebraska. That's exactly what they did. That's exactly what they should have done. Uh, the job should have done, too, as a matter of fact. And long story short, good night, I lost my nursing license. And to make a long story short and short, good night, I went up on the streets of Nebraska, is what happened to me. And you guys, I spent two years on the streets. And I told the Midwest, I prostituted myself, and I'll guarantee you one thing that I have seen and done things that no woman should ever see or do. And I'm still so sick in the head sometimes, I think to myself, I wouldn't mind seeing some of them again, you know. And my sponsor assures me I'm still a very ill person. What do you think of that kind of crap? And, you know, I've been in nut houses, I've been in detoxes, I've been in jails, I've been in institutions. I cannot think of a thing that was due to the practice of being an alcoholic. Things happened to me I would not repeat from this part of tonight. But I'm sure that you had the general idea. And two years went by for me. And there I was back there in Lincoln, standing on skid row, sucking on a bottle of Mad Dog. And I certainly had better things in tent of myself than to be doing that, i got to tell you. I will never forget that last day of my drinking as long as I live. And I hope to God it was the last day of my drinking. Although I really can't tell you that much about it, if you want to know the truth. I apparently was so physically sick, I just passed down the streets to have me. But before that happened, there was a Hilton Hotel adjacent to that Skid Row area. And I remember thinking to myself, two years ago, I used to stand on top of the Hilton Hotel and drink martinis with surgeons. What am I doing standing on Skid Row drinking with these people? And I rather imagine those folks felt the same way when they arrived there. And like I said, I can't tell you much about it at all. I woke up in an intensive care ward, the very hospital that I was born at, the very hospital that I worked at for 19 years. And I will tell you guys clearly that the alcoholic hell for me started when I got sober. You know, I'm not a very big person. I weighed 95 pounds when I got sober. And I was coming off a quarter whatever a day and 200 milligrams of Valium a day. That is a lot of booze. That's a lot of pills. And I had a lot of dying to do, let me tell you. They say that most alcohol withdrawal is over within three days. And perhaps it is for some people. It certainly was not for me. It was going to be a long, long time for us to start feeling better. I laid in that intensive care ward. I had tubes coming out of my belly. They were draining fluid off my liver. I had IVs going. And I found myself in withdrawal that was so bad I cannot begin to tell you guys. And I laid in that intensive care ward, and I shook, and I shook, and I died, and I died for 30 solid days. And I'd scream at those nurses and demand they give me narcotics for this withdrawal. They wouldn't give me a damn thing. They said, Karen, listen to us. There's nothing wrong with your heart. It's not throwing any regularities. You're not getting one damn drug, so quit asking us for them. You need to fill around those tremors, and maybe you'll never do it again. And I did not want to hear that, let me tell you. But let me tell you what these people did for me, and I'll be forever grateful as long as I'm sober and I'm Thomas. They got ten members of AA to come and sit with me. And, you know, I just want to say something real quickly here because I feel so strongly about this because it saved my life. Once in a while in AA, I hear people say, not very many people, and I hardly ever hear it. But when I hear it, I want to throttle by the neck. They say things like, we don't go unless the alcoholic calls us. Ladies and gentlemen, I am standing here 22 years sober tonight. I never made any damn phone call. Where did that crap come from? If it's good enough for our co-founders, by God, it's good enough for us. I think Bill called Bob as the story goes. I don't think Bob called Bill. I hope I never forget where the hell I'm coming from around here. And my responsibility statement does indeed say, when anyone anywhere reaches out for help, we want the hand of A always to be there. And for that, I'm responsible. The nurses reached out, the alcoholics responded, and I have to believe as a direct result that I'm standing here 22 years sober tonight. So I hope I never forget where I'm coming from around here. But anyway, you know, I just love these people. I fell in love with these people. There was nobody in my life, no family, nothing, and they were talking to me. For the first time in a long time, people were talking to me again. And they say things like, Karen, just keep breathing. That's all you got to do is breathe. And I say, when is this withdrawal going to stop? And they said, 
when it's time, that's what's going to stop. And that wasn't good enough for me. I wanted a date is what I wanted. And they couldn't give me a date, and they were absolutely accurate about that. When it's time, it's time. And at 30 days of sobriety, I walked to the official treatment from that hospital. I'm a product of the treatment center. I had no opinion on one way or the other, but apparently I went to a fine one because all they talked about was Alcoholics Anonymous. And, well, there's a lot of bad ones out there, you guys, let me tell you. And thank God I went to a good one. You know, when I went through treatment, a lot of people got kicked out of treatment for fraternizing. I didn't. No one else to fraternize with an orange person, I can assure you. <laughs> they used to bring, bring the patients over to the hospital, and they'd say, look at her, see what's going to happen if you keep on drinking? Look at her. <laughs> How dare you bring people in my room and say stuff like that? <laughs> but you know what, you guys, I am really good. In retrospect tonight, I'm really glad they did that. I get to think about that before I pick up any drink, but... I was not a quick study in that inpatient 30-day program due to my rotten behavior. I was in it for seven long months. That's a long time being in an inpatient 30-day program. But I completed the inpatient program. I went to an outpatient program. And I went to an evening care program. And I went to an aftercare program. And I found myself a very, very active member of Alcoholics Thomas in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I rapidly went through 19 sponsors in that town. I would tell the new people, you don't need to read the book. And you don't need a sponsor. You can do what I do around here. This is an individual program. And needless to say, I was not real popular with the old-timers in Lincoln, Nebraska. You guys, the old-timers now, you're so precious to me as I stand here tonight. But not in 1982. I could have cared less one way these people thought. And you can pull your crap out here just for so long. And these old-timers are going to start nailing you one right after the other. God loves me, old-timers now, quite Thomas. They at least saved my life. And boy, they are dying off right and left, i got to tell you guys. And they have taught me well, i got to tell you. But anyway, this old guy with 29 years of sobriety grabbed me up an evening day. He said, come outside, I want to talk to you. You stay away from new people. How dare you tell the new people in AA they read the book and they need a sponsor? He said, you're like a typhoid Mary in AA. Everybody dies around you, but you're able to stay sober somehow. He said, you stay away from new people. And he went on to tell me, there's going to be a man from California speaking in Pine, Nebraska this weekend. His name is Clancy. You know this man, speaker, and ask this man if he will sponsor you. He is a master of dealing with jerks like you. And I heard all about Clancy, and I want nothing to do with him, period, because I knew I was going to be in bad, bad trouble. And i got to tell you guys that my fears have been justified 8,000 times over. There. I told this old-timer, I said, who do you think you are that you're going to tell me he's going to be my sponsor now, Alcoholics Thomas? He said, if you don't get in that car and go with us Saturday, I'm going to tell everybody in Lincoln how you stole money from an AA meeting. And I'll guarantee you I was in that car going to Carney, Nebraska. I paid that money back, too, by the way. I did. I really did pay that. <laughs> you should never give newcomers money, folks. But I will tell you, that from a podium in Carney, Nebraska, that that man literally put the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous in my life. My life has never been the same since that talk. Anybody that knows me will tell you that's very, very true. And I found myself wanting that man for a sponsor. I wouldn't have asked him to sponsor me in a million years. Trust me, I would have asked him. And there I was, walking past that condition for it. That's how God works in my life, you guys. He does for me, apparently, what I can't do for myself and so forth. But I went to Clancy and I said, I'd like to ask you to be my sponsor. And he said, I don't sponsor crazy people like you. And I thought, what the hell did he say that to me? Where he doesn't even know me. And I sent him my little white dress on, my little white gloves on, acting like an angel. And he saw right through my crap, i got to tell you. Thing. He said, Karen, I wasn't aware of this, that this old-timer had called him two weeks prior to him coming to Nebraska and asked him if they brought me. He said, of course, I'll talk to him. Bring her up with you. So he's, I sent my little white dress on, my little white gloves on, acting like an angel. And he right, saw right through that, i got to tell you. And he said, Karen, I like to sponsor people on long-distance basis, but I'm going to do this for you because if I don't do it for you, you probably go die somewhere he said, I'm going to tell you something, little girl, and I'm going to say this one time and one time only. You're going to call me today. I tell you not to call me today. You're going to read that book. You're going to sponsor people. You come and act. You call me with Alcoholics Anonymous. You're not going to argue with me. You send your actions to me. You're going to do what I ask you to do. And if you don't want to do that, then get yourself a different sponsor. And you guys, you want to talk about we stood at the turning point. This is there in my recovery, really, to begin with Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said two words that I almost fell over when I said them. I said, yes, sir. I don't tell people, yes, sir. Trust me, I do not. One more time, God, do it for me that I can't do it for myself. The respect's got to start for me somewhere. You might as well start with my sponsor now, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went back to Lincoln. I became very, very active today in the right way. And I'm a son sponsoring a lot of women in that town. I am not bragging about that. It's not that much fun to sponsor 56 crazy women in Alcoholics Anonymous. But I agree to love those women very, very much. And I'll tell you why. They really showed me on the first four years of my sobriety what you do and what not to do in this program. And every one of those women is still sober today, with the exception of one. And she died in a car accident when she was 13 years sober. But she died sober, you guys, and it wasn't because of me. They were active, active members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the next direction my sponsor gave me, I want you to get that nursing license back. I tried to tell this man, I cannot get that kind of humiliation. He said, Karen, are you arguing with me? I said, no. He said, get the State Board of Nursing Nebraska. 
Tell those people you've been sober in A for a year and a half. You got the option to get your nursing license back. And you guys, I knew it wasn't going to work, but I did it anyway. And that's without a doubt the most important thing I can say at this podium tonight. I did what my sponsor asked me to do, whether I thought it would work or not. And I asked them for my license back. And they looked at me like I just thrown horns on the top of my head, I can assure you. And they said, how many links are you wanting to go to? And I had to do a lot, you guys. I had to take crap off people for two years that I wouldn't hire to mow my own lawn, for the truth. And I had to keep my mouth shut in the process, too. And one of the happiest days of my life occurred 18 years ago this last April. And one more time, I was stripped in front of the State Board of Nursing in Nebraska. And what they told me brought me to my knees for the first time in Alcox Thomas. They said, welcome home to fully reinstated as a registered nurse. And as a gift from AA, I not deserve it, by God, I intend to take it. I went to California to visit a couple times. I fell in love with Southern California AA, and I found myself telling my sponsor on the phone one day, I want to move to LA. Live in that crazy Venice Beach with all those crazy people. I knew I'd throw the glove and I've been wrong about it either. But on the Pacific Group, I want to look at UCLA in the operating room and be in two of their transplant teams, their heart and their transplant teams. I want this and I want that. And every single of those things have come true for me. And those are all gifts from AA. I deserve none of them. By God, I'm taking all of them. You know, early on, Clancy asked me. He said, Sharon, where are you at with your spiritual program? I said, Clancy, I don't believe in God. I cannot do that. And he flipped open the big book. I have been fortunate enough, you guys, to have a sponsor. He's been through the whole big book of Alcox Thomas with me. When I was brand new, I could barely put a thought together. And he'd have me read a paragraph to him and tell him what I thought that meant. Then he would tell me what he thought it meant. We've been through the whole book together. And what a great experience that was. It was the first time there's four pages in the book. Anyway, he flipped open the book and he, he says, you did a daily reprieve, contingent on a spiritual maintenance with power grin yourself. He said, there's going to come a day in your sobriety, but I can't help you. AA can't help you. And you had better well have your, a God in your life or you are dead from disease of alcoholism. I know that's very, very true. It has happened many, many times in my sobriety. And thank God I had a God in the time it happened. So I said the magic verse to my sponsor. What do you want me to do? He said, I want you to get on your knees in the morning, get on your knees at night. I want you to pray for God's will. Do not pray for things, pray for God's will and the power to carry it out. And I thought, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen him, but I did it. It's lame, but I'm doing it. So, and so I did that for four years in a row. I didn't feel any connection with God. I felt like a fool doing it for the truth. And every day I talked to Clancy on the phone and I'd say, I don't feel any connection with God. This is not working for me. He'd say, are you staying sober one day at a time in Athlas Thomas? I said, well, you know that I am. He said, that's the point of the whole thing. Are you stupid or what? I wasn't playing with a full deck when I arrived here. It took me a long, long time to do these little simple things. And in 1985, I found myself in Montreal, Canada, at the World Conference of Alcoholics Anonymous. If you guys haven't experienced a World Conference, I will see you next summer in Toronto, Canada. But anyway, it's something none of you should ever miss. And I drove straight through with five alcoholics. I made six, the sixth al alcoholic in that car, straight through from Lincoln, Nebraska to, to Montreal, Canada. I would do it again. If you paid my way, I wouldn't do it again. But anyway, and uh, we had no place to stay. We only had $100 apiece. But by God, we were going to that world conference, and we had to sleep outside we were going. Got to Montreal at the convention center. We found an apartment to rent for the whole week for $100. I could not believe our good luck. And I found myself in a great big football stadium at that Friday night meeting. And there was 64,000 sober alcoholics in that football stadium. And I was in awe of Alcoholics Anonymous and absolute awe of this program. They were down in the football field practicing for the flag ceremony. And Clancy was down there helping them direct that flag ceremony. And I know this all sounds real hokey to new people, but the longer I stay sober, the hokier I get for some reason. But alcoholics from all over the world carrying their national flags. And you guys, I'm from Nebraska, and I was impressed, let me tell you. I'm impressed today with people from all over the world in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I ran back up and joined my friends, and that flag ceremony started. And I will never forget this as long as I live, I'll never forget this. When the United States of America's flag touched the turf of that stadium, I saw 65,000 sober people go absolutely crazy. And I looked around myself, there was not one dry eye in that football stadium. I saw those old timers sitting around, all the new people, and all the people in between. And they all seemed to be loving these things so very, very much. And I remember thinking to myself, why can't I feel what these people are feeling? I, too, wanted to love A, and I could not seem to achieve it, you know. And for the first time in my life, I got tears in my eyes. I did not try and stop. And for the first time with any amount of sincerity, any amount of sincerity whatsoever, I said, oh, God, thank you for getting me here. Please help me to stay here. Please help me to love this poem as much as these people do. And I will tell you guys, in a foreign country, in a foreign land, I came to believe in a power greater than myself by watching and being with the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I really believe the old adage that we see we're ready to see, we hear we're ready to hear, not before. I also believe that the actions my sponsor gave me got me to that point. It's like, do it till you believe it. Just keep doing it whether you believe it or not. And anyway, for one solid second, my world stopped. But I remember that woman who was standing on Skid Row in Lincoln, Nebraska, who literally could not quit drinking, you guys, who literally could not get sober. And there she was two and a half years sober. 
I personally believe this thing is divinely inspired. How could anybody not believe that being here as long as I've been? And I taught that God every day sincerely since, because I believe what I've been taught here. I get a daily reprieve, and that's all that I get. You guys, I worked in surgery at UCLA for many, many years. I had back surgery, had to get out of there. I could no longer do OR nursing. I was not doing well with my back, so I went to the Zimmer Surgical Instrument Company, and, and I didn't really want to do corporate stuff like that, but you know what? I fell into this job, and I love that damn job. Now I wish I'd always worked there forever, you know. Now they pay me 46 bucks an hour. I'll take that. You know, and, and I get 6% of what I sell, and all I really do is service for contracts. But anyway... I was on the heart and liver transplant teams for years at UCLA, and I loved that job. I, I resented the hell out of leave that place, but now I'm glad I did. But anyway, anyway, uh, about 11 years ago, you know, my sponsor was trying to teach me, you have to do what God gives you to do. You have got to do what God gives you to do what's on your plate. I said, what are you talking about? He said, why don't you just answer the damn phone when it rings just for starters? You know, you guys, when I got sober, I did not have a telephone. It took me a long time to get a telephone now, Clark Thomas. By the time I got one, it was bill collectors. I sure as hell didn't want to talk to them. But I still picked up that phone, took the direction, started answering the phone. As a direct result of answering that telephone, I am $86,000 out of debt now, Clark Thomas. Well, it took me 18 short years, short years to do it. It's like paying for dead horses everywhere. But by God, I'm out of debt, you know. But anyway... So I've been taught to pick up the phone under any circumstances I'm to answer that telephone if I'm at home. So, so anyway, I started doing that. And this one particular night I want to tell you about, I've had so many people ask me to tell this story, and I thank you because then I get to relive it all over again and stuff. But anyway, so I started answering the telephone. So this one night I had off. We did 72 hours this particular week. And you know what we're like? We're too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. I was a bitch is what I was. And, and i so tired I couldn't even see straight. And, and I this night off, I went to eat early in the evening. I went home and I went to bed early. And the phone rang about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I thought, I'm not answering that damn phone. It's somebody I sponsor wanting to whine about something. Or it's my boss want me to come to work. And my head told me, pick up the damn phone. Somebody's in trouble. You guys have taught me well, I'm sorry to say. But So I picked up the telephone. And sure enough, it was my boss. And she said, I've got 18 people to sit over here tonight. I need your help. We do a liver transfer order that's about three years old. I have nobody to do it. Now get over here and help me. I said, I have worked 72 hours this week. I can't even think straight. I'm so tired. She said, Karen, I can't help it. I need you. I have nobody. And the phone went dead. I was going to call my sponsor, but I don't want to talk to him about nothing at 2 o'clock in the morning. I know that he told me nobody ever died from lack of sleep, Karen. I'd say, well, there's a first time for everything, Clancy. You know, but I'm so glad I did because the most precious thing happened, you guys. Really, I'm serious. And I got over there and I sent my order upstairs to bring our little patient down to surgery and he called me in the back and he said, you're not going to believe all the people of this family. And I thought, well, that's nice that they have the support. I was so proud of you guys. And we had a jet come from New York with a liver for this child. We had some time to kill and stuff. So I went out front to get my little patient. And the first thing I noticed was the mother. She had the most beautiful blue eyes I've ever seen before in my life. And the dad was good looking and stuff. And there was about 75, 80 people in this family. I thought how highly unusual at 4 o'clock in the morning. How highly unusual at any time if you want to know the truth. And then I looked down at my little patient. And I'm going to tell you guys that Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me to love at a level I never, ever, ever dreamt possible myself. And I ever so gently fell of this little baby girl. And she was so sick, she took her head off the pillow. She was so sick and dying from some strange liver thing. And in her little arms, she had a bear, and she had a blanket wrapped on that bear, hanging on here for dear life. And I'd been over and I talked to her. And, and I said, oh, you brought your little baby bear down to surgery. And she said, the little bear was going to have a liver transplant. And I said, oh, you're both going to have one. And she said, no, no, just the bear. You know, but you know. <laughs> We sent the family out the waiting room, and, and that mom was in absolute hysterics, i got to tell you guys. And this little girl looked at me, and she said, why is my mommy crying? Go tell my mommy I can cry. I can't stand my mommy cries. And because of Alcoholics Anonymous, what I learned in this program, I was able to tell that baby the truth. And I said, your mommy's crying because your mommy loves you so very, very much. And that seemed to settle her down a little bit and stuff. And we have an anesthesiologist at UCLA that loves to play with the kids, you guys. He is just a delight to work with. So when she got her IV started, the bear got an IV started. And his dad was called Bear She She thought that was real funny and stuff. And when she went to sleep, the bear went to sleep. And it was really quite painless for us, you wanted the truth. But that 6 hour transplant did not go well, i got to tell you guys. We almost lost that baby a couple times due to blood loss. I have never seen a team of people hold together like we did not for that child. And 16 hours later, she went up to her room with not much hope at all. I got to tell you guys, she had lost a tremendous amount of blood. Well, we said some prayers on that one, let me tell you. And I became obsessed with this child, and I had to see her again. And we have a rule at UCLA, you may not get involved with these transplant patients. They want the organs come from, we cannot tell them. It's best not to see them after surgery. Now, I tell anybody here tonight that I'm real good at breaking rules. Now, all right, I thought, I'm just going to go up and see her and see how she's doing. I'm not going to talk to anybody. So when that baby was six days post off in that transplant, I went to that child's room. I opened the door of that baby's room, and I could not believe it was in front of my face. 
my God, the power of God, the power of God. Here was this little baby girl. It was the first time she was successful in surgery. She was jumping up and down in her crib. She had diaper sand around her knees. She had a baby bottle in one hand. She had that bear in the other arm. And she put band-aids all over this bear. He had band-aids on his eyes, his ears, his nose, and I mean everywhere. And I stood in that hall and I just cried like a baby. It is not cool to see the nursing staff fall. And that whole room full of people in there. And something caught my eye out of the corner of my eye. And I'll be damned if our book wasn't sitting on that kid's dresser. And it all made sense to me. And I was in that room like a flash. And I said to Mom, I said, whose book is that? And she said, well, that's my book. I'm in with Alcoholics Anonymous. So is my husband. Her sponsor was there. His sponsor was there. And those 75, 80 people had driven 500 miles to be with his family. They were not from the L.A. area. And they showed me one more time what this thing is all about. It's about love and service, and that's all it's about. And I was impressed, let me tell you. And I said to Mom, I said, how long have you been sober? And she said, five years today. I thought, oh, my God, her baby up for the first time. What a fabulous birthday present and stuff. And I walked over to this child, and she stopped dead in her tracks. And she looked at me, and she said, go away, I'm not sick anymore. And I said, <laughs> I had my scrub clothes on. It scared the hell out of her. And I said, I didn't come up here to hurt you. I can't see how you're doing. You guys, she gave me her little bear, and she said, you take him home and take care of him. He's so sick, he needs some nurse to take care of him. I know why she gave me the bear to get me the hell away from it. I can feel like she wanted me to have him. So, and I told the mom, I said, I cannot take that baby's bear home. That bear with his kid's liver transplant. He had my her little head in the part of the surgery, you guys. And she said, Karen, please take it. She wants you to have it. She's got 50 bears in this room. And she did indeed have 50 bears in that room. And I felt like a fool walking down the hall with that bear. But that bear was my most prized possession. Put him about my psalmist for many, many years. They got to be too damned important to me. When it gets to be too important, we got to get rid of it, folks. Let me tell you. My little granddaughter says to me, Grandma, can I have that bear? And I said, it's Grandma's bear, Brandy. And she said, oh, I just wish I could have him. She knows the whole story. And I said, Grandma, will buy you 50 bears. She said, but I want that one, Grandma. I said, it's Grandma's bear. <laughs> and Levi said that to my little grandbaby. Anyway, it got so bad for me, I had to talk to Clancy about it. He said, give her the damn bear and quit being so damn selfish. <laughs> I thought, I'm getting a different sponsor. That is the last straw, by God. But obviously, I didn't. So that bear sits in Lincoln, Nebraska. Brandy's 22 years old now and has her own family. Band-Aids and Pat, who's a perfect bear, and I get to visit him a couple times a year. But anyway, I thought, I need to, you got to give it away, folks, to keep it. we got to give it away, I guess. But i got the memory that's good enough. But I thought, I need to reciprocate. I obviously was not prepared for a birthday party. And I knew something was in my pocket that Clancy gave me when I was five years sober. I was now 11 years sober. I've hung on that medallion for six years too long. The reason that's in my pocket night at work, there's narcotic keys next to that medallion. I'll tell anybody in this room tonight. Now, I open that cupboard sometimes, my eyes light up like firecrackers. I can grab it and remember the hell I'm coming from here. But I could not seem to find the woman that was special enough, in my opinion, to give my five-year medallion to. And I knew I'd found her, let me tell you. I gave it to her, and she says, oh, Karen, I can't take that. My God, Clancy. I said, no, I want you to have it. And I really, really meant that. That's what she eventually did for me around here. So. And the nurses got wind of all this. We got a cake for the mother. We celebrated her five years of sobriety. I got my sponsor on the telephone. Within three hours, we had about 50 cars in front of UCLA. And I cannot begin to tell you guys how proud I was to take those people to my home group in Alcohol Thomas and I could visit it. There's been no more contact with them. It's got to be that way for many, many reasons. But now that baby's doing very, very well and stuff. And the point I'm trying to make here, I could have missed the whole damn thing if I would have picked up that telephone. How many times in my life have I missed up because I wouldn't take a simple action like answering the damn phone? That makes me crazy if I think about it long enough. But, you know, people say to me all the time, Karen, why do you keep doing this? Why do you keep doing it? And I know of no greater thing to say to them than where our 12th edition says long form. So that this to the end, that my great blessings may never spoil me, I may forever live in thankful contemplation of him who presides over us all. And there's more reasons than that for me. You're the ones that walked me when nobody else would walk with me. You held my hand when nobody else would hold my hand. And you told me that you loved me. And I need you as desperate as I need you in 1982. You've taught me how to live. You've taught me how to love. You've taught me how to keep my pants up and all those things. And I don't do any of those things very well. But I'll tell you the one thing that I do with 200% absolute perfection, and that is this. That I love this program more than even the whole world. It's truly a story from an alcoholic hell I cannot even describe. I have truly been given. Just like the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous Alcohol says, I have truly been given the keys to the kingdom. And I'm going to say one more thing, and I'm going to shut my mouth here right on time. It has been one hell of a walk from Skid Row, Nebraska. So I stand in Oklahoma tonight, and I think that but for the grace of God, now Alcoholics Anonymous said I would have missed it all. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for my life.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.